since I was about 15 years old. Uh, so I started reflecting a little bit on what motivated me to stay engaged in social change and social activism for 30 years, given all of the uh, turns and twists and, and uh, uh, some of the sacrifices that people made. And as I started thinking about the, the uh, motivations and the reasons and the explanations, I noticed that a lot of them uh, really had to do more with aesthetics and ideas of beauty and creativity than uh, things around sort of traditional social change models. So um, I put together four kind of quick stories today to talk about uh, commitment to social change, but really coming from the perspective of creativity and what makes us do this work um, almost as a, a form of, of, of self-expression uh, as much as a, a form of, of, of scientific uh, analysis. So. The first question I, I really, the sort of framing question here really is, can social change be beautiful? What would it look like? What would it mean? How would we talk about it? Uh, what kind of language would we use? Um, so the first story uh, goes back to 1976. And so I've been an activist since, since I was 15, but when I was 10, before any of this started, um, there was a craze for go-kart building in my neighborhood in Connecticut. And all of the kids' dads built them these go-karts that looked kind of like this. Um, they were little platforms of wheels, and uh, they all had the go-karts, they were riding down the, the hills, and I, I decided that I wanted a go-kart, but I didn't, I, di I didn't need my dad to build me a go-kart, I was going to go do it myself. And so uh, I went out and I started collecting wood around the neighborhood and dragging it into my backyard, and I got some saws and hammers and nails, and I started nailing this stuff together into a go-kart. Um, but the go-kart that I built wasn't just a regular old go-kart. The, the vision that I had for a go-kart was that I wanted this thing to be the Taj Mahal of go-karts. I wanted it to have a roof. I wanted it to be amazing, like absolutely audacious, that nobody had ever seen a go-kart like this. And it didn't matter to me that I had no idea how to build a go-kart or even how the wheels were supposed to go on or even how to work with a saw or a hammer. I worked on this go-kart all summer long. Um, and I did it because I had this vision and this dream of doing something really spectacular. And this is the go-kart. That's my dog, Max. And that's me at 10. Um, the go-kart, you know, it's a little bit slapdash, but I had this vision for it that was uh, bigger than, than what I started out with, and it really kept me motivated to work on it for years. And so one of the things I, that I learned from this is this notion that what makes people work or what makes me work is a sense of, uh, of daring to do something that's a little bit beyond the expected, that, that requires a certain degree of imagination. I love this quote from Theodore Roosevelt because he says, dare mighty things. And, and he talks about how it's about trying something out and just throwing yourself out into the space and seeing what happens. And so the first lesson that I got from this is dare th things. And it, I think it does fit into things like uh, social policy. Actually, there's a picture here of Central Park, which I think is a pretty good example of daring something really amazing and doing something so audacious that really did work uh, and has an aesthetic quality beyond just its social science benefits. Second story comes from Colombia. Um, I came here to campus in 1980. Five, and uh, I became a political science major. And when I, uh, when I started taking classes and I started looking at um, the program offerings, I realized that I was actually, actually a little bit disappointed. Um, and the first reason I was disappointed is because I, I was told that politics was a science. And that wasn't really how I thought about it. Um, the classes that they were offering had to do with uh, the Iron Triangle uh, structures in Congress or the cost-benefit analysis curves about uh, what, what, makes it, what makes it make sense to, to invest in a social outcome. And it seemed very, um, a little bit bean counting to me, a little bit too uh, mechanical. And it didn't really inspire me all that much. Um, but I majored in political science anyways, and I became a student activist. In fact, I was a university senator in this building in the 1980s. I used to go to a lot of meetings. Um, but the things that motivated me had a lot more to do with the sort of romance of politics and the, the drama of doing something that was really cool and interesting and it felt like it was emotionally laden with intensity. So when I got to campus, that bottom picture is what I saw, which is a bunch of students that had locked the doors of Hamilton Hall shut for the divestment protests. And they became the people that I became friends with. And they weren't just smart social activists, they were also really cool people and I wanted to be like them and I wanted to emulate them. Um, and I was inspired by 1960s activists like Abby Hoffman and uh, I'm not sure how many of you recognize Bayard Rust in there, but he organized the March on Washington. And uh, these are people that were both, they weren't just activists to make change, but they also had a, uh, they created a sort of emotional content and, and a, a beauty that went along with it. 
Um, and I, uh, I, I came out of my time at Columbia with a lot of commitment to, to change from that. Um, and there's this quote from an essay by Norman Mailer where he says, uh, he's talking about the sort of uh, urban hipster types, and he says, like children, that hipsters are fighting for the sweet. He said, unstated but, but, but obvious is the social sense that there's not really enough sweet for everyone. Um, it's this notion that trying to do something that's really worthwhile and really cool uh, is uh, there's a, an element of scarcity to it. There's a specialness to it. Um, so not everybody can do it all the time. Uh, and, and there's a sense, sort of an artistic expression there. So um, the lesson that I draw from this is, uh, this is a picture of a ACT UP demonstration, which I also was, got to see when I was around the eight, 1980s, um, focused on uh, the, uh, the efforts to get uh, more research and, and uh, treatment for HIV uh, research. But a lot of what people were doing was they were disrupting, and they were creating uh, change by being disruptive forces as individuals and as activists. And the element of disruption had a kind of a preciousness to it, a sweetness to it, around saying, we're not going to just accept whatever the standard um, framework is that people are offering us, but we're doing something that's more confrontational and more creative in, in its nature. Um, third short story here is uh, when I graduated from Columbia, my first job out of college, I was a, I was a, uh, a community organizer. And I worked with uh, low-income buildings all over the city, uh, many of them in the, in the South Bronx, which uh, looked like this in 1989 when I graduated. My brother actually took this picture in 1990 in the South Bronx. Um, and the job that I had was I trained people how to manage buildings. I taught classes to uh, tenants' associations, and I did meetings. Um, and I did that for about seven years. Uh, I walked up and down you know, streets and stairways and worked in people's apartments, taught classes. So every single day, I taught classes all day long to senior citizens, to tenant associations. I wrote curriculum. Um, and uh, over the course of about, about seven years, I got pretty good at it. That became my sort of area of expertise. It was the thing I was best at. Um, this is actually a photograph. My, my brother also took this one. It's the same. It's the same view, but this is 15 years later. It's, I'm sorry, 25 years later. This is 2009, um, and this is what the Bronx looks like today. Because a lot of the work that people were doing, rebuilding it and getting tenant uh, tenant associations to uh, manage their buildings, turned into more manageable housing programs. But while this was happening, while we were working on this, what made it meaningful for me was that I got to spend my 10,000 hours, as Malcolm, La Malcolm Gladwell says that, you know, when you get, when you, in order to get really good at something, you have to spend 10,000 hours at it. Um, and I did some math. I don't think I actually spent 10,000 hours, but it was probably something like 8,000 hours. So I'm claiming this. Um, but I spent about, you know, thousands and thousands of hours working with people in community settings, training and teaching and managing and organizing and communicating and trying to get people to um, develop program activities that would uh, save a building and get somebody to invest in it and fix the, uh, the plumbing, but also get a tenants association to be able to turn the building into a co-op. And so that period of my career and the work that I did was really about developing a level of expertise and mastery over a craft that became really important to my later, my later work. Um, so the third message that I got is develop technical mastery. This is actually a, uh, a photograph from a project that we did in, in, uh, in Moscow where I got to go to work with Russian community organizations in, in Moscow for a couple of years. Um, but again, thousands of hours of sitting in meetings and trying to figure out how to do something and you get pretty good at certain technical elements of it. The last part of this, uh, the story, the fourth part, is really what I've been working on for the last uh, 10 years now. I started a nonprofit in 2004 called Older Adults Technology Services. And when I started OATS, um, I had this vision of working with senior citizens, helping to get them online and get them uh, technically proficient, getting people on email. Um, back then, only about 25% of senior citizens were on the internet at all. Today, it's more about more like 55%, but you're still looking about half of the people almost over the age of 60 who've never used the internet. Um, and I had this vision of creating community-based programs that would help senior citizens with technology and do something that was audacious and powerful. Um, and when I started, the vast majority of senior, senior centers in New York City were, um, were like this. This is a, a, a typical one. They're in the public housing developments. They were often in the basements of churches. Um, they were very poorly funded. Uh, New York had about 250 senior centers. And um, 
every year the senior centers would give back millions of dollars to the city government because the seniors wouldn't even come in to take advantage of the lunches. Um, they were underutilized because the program quality was relatively low because the funding was poor. Um, and we had this idea at that point of doing something completely different and much more aggressive and uh, you might even say daring or audacious. Um, we wanted to create a center that would be organized around technology that would be the country's first technology-themed community center for older adults, where people could come into a center and it wouldn't feel like a church basement and it wouldn't feel like something that was just sort of a big institution that you were just kind of getting plugged into, but it would be a center that was joyous and that was really powerful and that was visually exciting and compelling that would be something that if you had a lot of money to spend to go somewhere, you might go to a place like this. But we would give it to you for free and we would set the site up to have that kind of, a, of an impact. So I started working with a group of uh, staff on this about five years ago. We were able to secure a federal grant um, from the Department of Commerce and we raised a million dollars. And we looked at 70 locations in Lower Manhattan uh, before we found a spot that was big enough and had an, uh, it was at retail right on the street that would be airy enough and beautiful enough that we thought we could build something. And we hired an architect who had worked for Richard Meyer, who's the modern architect that uh, has done some of New York's most beautiful modern buildings lately. And we brought these people together and we built the Senior Planet Exploration Center. We launched that last year and these are some photographs from it. Um, the middle photograph here is the, the main space where people come in and it's, it is a training facility but it's also a place where people can come in and just try out technology and do whatever seems fun to them. I like to think of it a, a little bit like that uh, scene in Willy Wonka where they, they go into the, the garden and everything is sort of you can reach out and, and, and eat the beautiful flowers and there's a chocolate river, you know, it's got that kind of a feeling of exploration and discovery. Um, and when you're there, there's, people are so focused and there's so much energy around them, they're so excited. And that the seniors would pull me aside and, and I remember the first couple of months after we opened the center, um, they, they would come to me and, and where people used to say, oh, I loved the class, I had a great class. Now when they were at the center, they started saying things like, I love what you're trying to do here. Which meant that they understood that we were trying to achieve something, we were trying to create something different. Not that I was trying to teach them a class, but I was trying to somehow catalyze some sort of personal transformation. And people then have on board with that. So people have, have actually taken over some of our classes and started generating their own classes. So uh, we were teaching people how to do, um, go online and, and uh, sign up for some kind of online courses. And somebody found out about Etsy. And uh, one of the seniors decided to start her own Etsy account so that she could sell handbags on the internet. And she was at the center and she sold her first handbag. Everybody was so excited about it that they started their own little micro-entrepreneurship group to do selling Etsy stuff. And now they're generating their own classes. Um, that lower picture is, is enrollment day at the center. So when we do a class uh, at 8.30 in the morning, we sign up to show up to enroll people. We have 250 people in line outside the center on Saturday. Um, and part of the dynamic here is that people understand something different is happening at the Senior Planet Center. Um, that location is on 25th Street between 6 and 7. So if anybody ever wants to go visit it, 127 West 25th. Um, and what, what I've learned from the work that I've been doing at Oates and the work with the Senior Planet Center is uh, the fourth piece of this is what makes the work distinctive and what makes it different is that we think about older adults as um, human beings with incredible potential and capacity. And in contrast, a lot of the time when I've looked at other models of working with senior citizens, uh, they tend to see senior citizens as, through kind of a deficit lens. Um, people see older people as uh, kind of a, a group of problems or sicknesses, uh, you know, that have to be solved. So it's like, oh, seniors don't have all that much capability, they're frail, so we should take care of them, uh, and they should receive our services, and they should be passive. Um, and there are clearly people that are frail and need care, but one of the things that I've learned from working at Oates is that um, most older adults if you really ask them what they want and what change they would like to see in their life, they feel like their, their capacity is being wasted. They feel like they have more to offer and they're not, no one's taking advantage of that. No one's giving them a platform or a chance to build something or create something amazing or special. And what I have found is, is when we build programs that are more human oriented, that, that unleash people's creativity and potential, it creates the kind of dynamic that we have at the center. So the fourth lesson that I've come up with from this is, you know, just the phrase covet humanity, uh, I think is sort of a, 
a, a little guideline for us as we build programs. Um, and when we think about what we're doing at the center, we really do sit down and say, what does one of our prototypical older adults want? And how can we create something that is like spectacularly awesome for this person that really treats them with respect and love so that they feel like we're listening? And we have to take a lot of risks to do that. A lot of our programs, uh, we try them for the first time and they don't work as well as we want them to and we revise and change and try different things. But um, most of the time we hit the mark and people really get a lot out of, of the programs that we're doing. So when I think about these sort of four elements and, and how that's come together in the career that I've built and what's made me keep doing this um, over the last really 30 years now um, and what's made the Senior Planet Center special, I think about this as sort of four pieces that, that I think are, are driving me and my staff to do the work that we do at the level we do it at. Um, and, and the four pieces are starting with something audacious. You know, have an ambition. Pick something that's really amazing, that's challenging, that no one's done before. And take, have some courage. Go out and fight for it. See what you can do. Um, sometimes it doesn't happen, but when it does, it can really mean something powerful. Secondly, be disruptive. You know, we went into a system that was kind of asking too little of us and too little of the people that we were working with, and we tried to create a model that would be disruptive and challenging. Um, and in some ways, uh, we're not trying to do everything for everyone. We're trying to do one thing that is uh, a little sweet, a little bit uh, scarce and distinctive, but it's good enough that a lot of people want to come and be part of it, and it's really helped create a different um, way of doing the work that we're doing. And now a lot of other centers are coming to us and picking up on some of the model building that we're doing. Third, there. Um, there's an element of, of technical mastery that's, that's needed for this sort of thing. When you think about a painter and they, they spend years studying how to get just a certain, a certain effect with the paintbrush, um, the staff and I have literally tens of thousands of hours working with seniors over the years uh, and doing parallel work. So when we build a program or write a class or develop a piece of, of, uh, of uh, curriculum, we are able to bring to bear that 10,000 hours worth of mastery to get it right and to visualize what's going to happen within a classroom when we're writing the curriculum so that it's that good. And that's part of the art of doing social change, is being really good at your craft. And that's been critical. And then finally, be humane and just caring about people. Um, you know, there's a, uh, there was a moment a woman came to one of our uh, programs a couple of months ago and she wanted to speak and uh, there was very little time, there was a speaker that was presenting and uh, she wanted the microphone and there was this sort of pause about whether or not we should stop and go and she was about 90 years old in the back of the audience and we decided to, I, I, I realized if we're here helping older adults connect and, and express themselves, we need to take more chances and give them the microphone. And so I went to the back of the room and I handed this woman the microphone and she was dressed kind of like the the girl in uh, the Morton's Salt commercial, you know, with the hat and the overcoat. And uh, she took the mic and she said, you know, um, I'm an amateur gerontologist, and I just want to say that when you're speaking at these events, sometimes it's hard for me to understand what you're saying because you talk too fast. <laughs> and the trainer stopped and said, that's incredibly helpful. We didn't, we'd never known that if we hadn't asked you to comment. And so that kind of element of humanity and making sure that we're embracing the people that we work with and standing next to them instead of above them or looking you know, at them as, as clients, but rather as collaborators, is a really essential element to what we're doing. So there are many different ways of looking at it. I'm sure there are different elements that people could come up with, but for, from where I sit in terms of the trajectory of my career, uh, what's enabled me to commit uh, looks kind of like this. So uh, that's why we commit.